We are back yet again on the Thick Mending Podcast, and this week is a wonderful week throughout the NFL. The Bengals have been vanquished in the Super Bowl in a game which was electrifying down to the very last play. One of the better Super Bowls in recent memory, a little bit of ref ball here, a little bit of ref ball there, but all in all, a very pleasurable viewing experience. And after the Super Bowl, it is pretty clear the Bengals simply did not belong on the NFL's biggest stage. So let's take a look back at all the games this season that proved the Bengals were frauds. Starting in the playoffs, they only beat a mediocre Raiders squad because of horrible refing and car selling. In the next round, all the Titans stars were playing through injuries and Ryan Daniel went full Benedict Arnold. In both Chiefs games, it is pretty clear Patrick Mahomes is partially colorblind and cannot see anything orange, so those games really should not be wins. Getting into the regular season, they lost to the injured Browns team twice, pathetic. They lost to the Jets and the Bears. Comical. They only beat the Jaguars by three. That's a loss in my books. The refs stole the week one game from the Vikings, so that's another L. And finally, the rest of the AFC North was injured beyond belief, so really they should have another two losses from the Steelers and the Ravens at minimum. In total, the Bengals had a record of 5-12 and this year and should not have even been in the playoffs, let alone the Super Bowl. But it really goes to show that once the Bengals played a real team like the Rams, they were always going to get exposed. They got exposed by the Niners earlier in the year. It was a bad showing at all. Burrow looked cold. The offense was only effective when ripping Jalen Ramsey's face mask off, and they really could not stand up to Aaron Donald and Von Miller. Aaron Donald, in particular, received a tremendous amount of attention. At one point, he was triple teamed. Still, he managed to make a play on the quarterback, shoving him out of bounds. It was a wonderful defensive showing for that Rams unit. I'm truly fortunate to have the opportunity to watch that, but I am even more fortunate to celebrate the downfall of the Bengals. It is a great day throughout the NFL. 31 other fan bases are celebrating. So Tristan, tell us a little bit more about the Bengals' failures. Well, this year's Super Bowl was amazing. You said it right away. I thoroughly enjoyed every minute of the game. It was a great viewing experience, especially from someone that wasn't a fan of a team playing in the game, with the exception of Odell's injury. That one made me sad, and that one hurt. And it is glaringly obvious that Isaiah and I are not Bengals fans, and we are at war with their fan base on TikTok. But I will never understand, from an objective perspective, why Bengals fans are so upset with penalties that were called or weren't called, and why they are in general acting like complete whiny children. The refs literally handed the Bengals a free touchdown by not calling an offensive pass interference on D. Higgins, yet Bengals fans are mad about a holding call, a holding call which did not even technically put points on the board for the Rams, where the Jalen Ramsey T. Higgins no call put points up on the board for the Bengals. The Bengals defense still had a chance to make a stop after the holding call, yet they didn't because they suck. Bengals fans are acting like their team had to fight through adversity in this game when that just isn't close to the truth they act like their bad offensive line play is someone else's fault and that joe burrow couldn't do anything about it first of all the Bengals chose their offensive line before the season started and maybe joe burrow just shouldn't hold on to the ball as long as he does or zach taylor should have double teamed aaron donald that might have been a good idea every single play or used six and seven man protections more often the Bengals are the cause of their own failure on offense in this game and it is pathetic that Bengals fans aren't acknowledging it and then on the ramp side of things they are the ones that are the victims of bad luck they dealt with it and found a way to win they were on their fourth and fifth string receivers after odell went down with the injury and they were on their third string tight end yet it seems like it's not being widely acknowledged by the media or the Bengals fan base i have even seen comments on social media say the rams were somehow fraudulent and that their offense was pathetic for only putting up 23 points i want to know how many other teams would put up 23 points missing odell robert woods tyler hitch Higby and uh, Kendall Bland. They were missing almost every single skill position player on their team with the exception of their best one in Cooper Cup. Obviously the most important one, but still. Can you imagine if the Bengals would have won that game and all they had on offense was Jamar Chase and T. Higgins and Tyler Boyd were hurt, C.J. Ozama was out, and Drew Sample was out. It would have been a, just a Joe Burrow slobber fest all over the media, praising him as better than Tom Brady already and that he's eclipsed GOAT status. It would have been just a media nightmare. It would have been making me throw up. So I think the Rams offense, Cooper Cup and Matthew Stafford, they're getting a little bit passed over when you look at what the injuries they were dealing on offense. What they did was impressive, and I I feel bad for them that it's not being acknowledged more. I do think it was a fairly impressive showing for many members of that offense. Stafford did have that one bad interception, the other one pretty clearly not his fault, a tipped ball. Rams offense did what they needed to do when it mattered the most. Cooper Cup, two very big touchdowns. Granted, they were against Eli Apple, so I think there's a 
little bit of an asterisk was goes with those. A little bit of credit taken away from the young fella, but the Rams offense played perfectly fine, particularly when you consider what this Bengals defense had done in the second half of playoff games throughout the year, what they did to the Chiefs two weeks ago. They lock up in the second half, but still the Rams found a way to put points on the board and win the game. And going back to the man I just briefly mentioned, Eli Apple has been crucified throughout social media, both by fans and by players. That's very funny to me. It's even funnier to Tristan as a former Giants fan, but he really is the reason why the Bengals lost this game. If they had at best an average cornerback instead of Eli Apple there, at least one of those touchdowns probably doesn't happen for Cooper Cup. Those penalties might not be as frequent. Eli Apple completely sold the Bengals fans, which is why I think I'm going to be purchasing an Eli Apple jersey in the very near future. He is truly my hero. He maybe should have won Super Bowl MVP over some guys on the Rams. Isaiah, have you seen the clip where Eli Apple, I think, is down on the ground after a tackle? Puts his hand up, tries to get some help from his teammates, ignored. And I don't think that was uh, not after the uh, second one. That was mid-game before he really starts screwing up. I don't think anybody likes Eli Apple, besides his mother, of course. And hey, it's good to have support from your mother. You're still living with your mother, so you can attest something you want or someone you want in your corner. But come on, man. Eli Apple is maybe the most universally hated player in the NFL, which is weird considering some of the felons playing in the league, but hey, that is what you get for running your mouth on the biggest stage. I, I mean, I enjoyed watching Eli Apple fall flat on his face. He's one of the many bust draft picks the Giants have had over the last few years. And Cooper Cup's performance, I think it was extremely impressive. I don't think people are acknowledging it enough. I know he's getting a lot of praise. He did win the Super Bowl MVP. And there are even people saying he didn't deserve it because of how good Aaron Donald was. I even think in this situation, there should be two Super Bowl MVPs because Aaron Donald was so spectacular and Cooper Cup was so spectacular. But on the Rams' last offensive drive, if Cooper Cup isn't as good as he is, the Rams offense isn't getting that last touchdown he absolutely took over was double teamed triple teamed every single play was shadowed over the top with a safety was shadowed inside with a linebacker he still found a way to get open he found weak spots in zone coverage and he helped the rams go down the field and score on the end around on fourth down he found a way to get the first down cut inside the defensive end and got the first down he was really good and to the people saying aaron donald deserved it more by default because he got the game winning tackle or he was dominant all game long. I feel like it's a little bit dismissive of Cooper Cup. And for Aaron Donald's case, yes, of course he was really good. He had two sacks in the game, game winning tackle. He's just as deserving. And this is complete speculation, but the reason I'm guessing that Cooper Cup got it over Aaron Donald is because the Rams defensive line was so good as a unit. Vaughn had two sacks, Leonard Floyd had a sack, they'd seven total sacks, and maybe honoring Aaron Donald would have been too singular just due to how good the entire defensive line was. I mean, Vaughn Miller got the Super Bowl MVP when another player on that Broncos squad back in 2015, I believe, had virtually the exact same stat, so I don't think that's a very good argument. And you talk about Cooper Cup going down there on the last drive of the game for the Rams and making the game-winning touchdown. If Aaron Donald isn't the best defensive player in football, he does not get that pressure on Joe Burrow, does not drag him down, and that is probably a first down for the Bengals, and that drive is very much alive. They are very nearly in McPherson range. The Bengals' best player is their kicker, and he has shown the ability to hit those big kicks in the AFC Championship game in every single format whatsoever. Pearson is a man I fear more than any other Bengals player and Aaron Donald completely eliminated from the game with his greatness because he made the final play of the game. So I do think he deserves more credit. I think he should have been the Super Bowl MVP. You say well he should have been double or triple teamed more earlier. He was double and triple teamed a lot. One of the few times he was left one on one with the guard it resulted in a sack. You really do not see a 320 pound man getting blown backwards on the biggest stage in all of football all that often, but Aaron Donald did that to a Bengals offensive lineman, so it really cannot be said enough how much of an impact he had. The reason Von Miller had the sacks he had this game is because of the attention Aaron Donald garners. He is the most impactful player in football on the defensive side of the ball. It's like Steph Curry in a way when it comes to his gravity. Steph Curry brings a bunch of people out to the three-point line, makes a lot of shots easier for his teammates to make. Aaron Donald draws a lot of attention inside, making it much easier for the defensive ends to get around the tackles and be one-on-one and have the opportunity to shine. Aaron Donald is the reason that Rams D-line and pass rush was so effective and he's the reason they won the game. He deserved the MVP. I have no real issue with Cup getting it. I think part of that's to the narrative of the triple crown winner, the wide receiver and all that and offensive bias in the media, which hey, that's always going to be a thing. Super Bowl MVP does not go to defenders all that often these days. So can't really blame Vlad, but Darnell had a very special game and deserves his ring. 
I wasn't saying he didn't deserve it. I think it's a case where there could be two Super Bowl MVPs. If there was an offensive MVP of the Super Bowl and a defensive MVP of the Super Bowl, it'd be Cooper Cup and Aaron Donald. I think they were equally spectacular in their own right. Cooper Cup was just as important to the Rams offense as Aaron Donald was to the Rams defense in that game, in my opinion. Yeah, but at the end of the day, I still think it comes down to Cup being a wide receiver and having some of his impact limited by getting the ball from the quarterback. Huge impact draws a lot of coverage. Really, every player on the offensive side of the ball besides the wide receivers is directly impacted by Aaron Donald and even the wide receivers are indirectly impacted by Donald because of how quickly Burrow has to get the ball out. They can't run the routes they want to run because that monster coming up the middle hard in Burrow's face over and over again all night. So in terms of impact I think he has the edge. Yeah you like that phrasing don't you you sicko? (laughs) But it's not something I'm wanting to get in a big debate over. I think both of them played very well. I think both of them are going to wind up in Canton one day although it's hard for wide receivers to get into the Hall of Fame these days. But hey, Donald, one of the best defensive players ever, making the case for the best defensive player ever. Still not going to catch Paige, still not going to catch LT, but what are you going to do? Limited by the times he plays in. One of the unsung heroes of Super Bowl weekend has to be Odell Beckham's PR team. For some reason, the media has decided to make OBJ some sort of victim of the Cleveland situation, that his victory is this great triumph some underdog story made manifest. In reality, Odell has forced his way out of the last two teams he's been on, and his father played a bigger impact than he did in the second half of the Super Bowl. Grand dude injury, but let's take a real look at what happened with Odell and why the media is making him out to be some darling. Odell refused to answer calls from his teammates, from his coaches. He let his agent negotiate his way out of Cleveland after his dad went on Instagram and made a video bashing Baker Mayfield and the Browns organization. The Browns did not have to release Odell. They could have held on him until the end of the season. They weren't getting anything back from regardless it could have been petty instead they were very polite they let him go and try and get with a contender all this is after Odell got on TV with little Wayne in New York and talked about how he wasn't happy with the Giants this was coming on the hills of his diva ish career in the Big Apple which was highlighted by a video of him in bed with cocaine and a certain photograph taken on a boat which preceded one of the worst playoff losses in franchise history then there's the GQ interview where Odell credited himself for keeping the Giants brand alive meanwhile the four 13 Giants, who had Daniel Jones, Jake Fromm, and Mike Glennon starting for them at quarterback, was still one of the most talked about teams in football this year. It doesn't make sense. Yet he is still portrayed as this good guy, despite forcing his way out of two situations. So this leads me to ask, how has he done this? Is it because Baker Mayfield is so heavily hated in the media? Like, I can't make it make sense. Obviously, I'm not happy Odell got hurt, but the praise he's been getting from all these outside sources, from the Adam Schefters, from the commentators, it boggles my mind. Baker Mayfield is getting so much hate because Odell succeeded. Meanwhile, a guy like Matthew Stafford, who on some very bad Detroit teams, played through injury, put up bad stats, and was praised for being a tough guy. Baker does it, and everyone takes their shots and laughs at him. I don't quite understand it. Maybe you can help shine some light on this, Tristan. How do you, as a fan of a team Odell spurned and disrespected, deal with the fact that uh, the media decided to portray him as a good guy now? You know, Isaiah... I almost have to think that this is coming from a place of just wanting to piss me off with uh, your low IQ plays. I I don't really even comprehend how you genuinely can believe everything, every word that just came out of your mouth. Everything that just came out of my mouth was factual. Stuff about his father's Instagram, that's true. The Browns releasing, No, that is uh, true. uh, Let me get, I'm about to address. The interview in the cocaine, true. The boat picture, True. GQ, you let me true. let me address what you said, and if there's something that I miss, you are welcome to interject and correct me or remind me of it. That way, I can respond to that specific thing. So, when it comes to the giant situation, what I will say is that I do think that was a point in Odell's career where he was more immature and that he didn't necessarily make the best decisions. And I acknowledge that. But as a Giants fan, I also think it is very true. And at the time, he said he was keeping the Giants brand alive. And you saying that the Giants this year, their brand was still alive and that they were still heavily talked about. I don't find that to be true at all. I found myself turning off the game. I didn't even watch the last six games because of how bad they were. There was nothing exciting about them. And I think many other people felt the same way. So I think you saying that they were just as much talked about is more of a product of talking to me than anything else. I don't think that's a product of the Giants brand being relevant. I didn't say they were as big, but you have to keep in mind, you still have the segments on the shows talking about the Giants future. You still have Steven 
A. Smith and Michael Irving and Skip and Shannon debating about the Giants. Meanwhile, if they played in, let's say, the AFC West, there were some no-name team out there. Like, if the Chargers had the exact same season the Giants had, you would not hear a peep about it, but because they're in the Big Apple, one of the biggest football markets out there, maybe even the biggest, you still get to talk about their future going forward, when in reality, most teams in their situation are ignored. The Giants are a massive brand before, during, and after That is Odell. obviously true because they are in New York City, so that is going to be the case. But they're not as big as they were when they had Odell. They're not as big as they were when they've been good, and they're greatly diminished as a brand compared to when they were very good. Yeah, and that's good. because they're so not Odell good, not because of Odell. If Odell hadn't been there, they would have probably been just about as big a brand if they had gone 11-5 and five while being in that market. Odell is one of, he's one of the five most popular players in the NFL from a branding social media standpoint, from every single standpoint. So that is just a, a Are weird we sure hill about to die that? on. Are we going to die on the top A five weird hill. That, let me finish. You, you, you said you were more than welcome inter- for me to You're jump treating. in. I'm jumping in. When I'm missing something and not addressing something, and I didn't say the jump in because you disagree with what I'm saying. I did I not say like that. I'll let you keep talking about the Giants. Go on. So I, I do think that's uh, I do think that was a point in his career where he was more uh, immature, if you want to call it that. But then when it comes to him on the Browns, I completely disagree with the notion that he was ever immature at the Browns. In his first few seasons, we didn't hear one peep from him. He went along with everything. And this just his last season, in off in the off season, he went to work out with Baker Mayfield. He worked out with Jarvis Landry in the off season. He did everything to try and get the ball, and the Browns simply weren't getting him the ball. At the end of the day, he needed to get out of there. If the Browns aren't going to take advantage of him, why stay? It didn't benefit the Browns. It didn't benefit him. It didn't benefit Baker Mayfield. There was a constant narrative, which I think was negative for Baker and was negative for Odell, that Odell didn't work in the Browns offense and that Baker didn't understand how to use Odell. So I I think that whole narrative was stupid in the first place. And when it comes to the video that his dad put out, that his dad retweeted, you said he put it out. He simply tweeted a video that was already a month old or a couple weeks old at the time. His dad did not make the video. It's not like Odell's PR team went out and set this thing up to try and get him out of there. It was his dad simply promoting a video that already existed. So right there, there's a false narrative. And I think it's a little bit overblown that he pushed his way out of the Browns. I don't think that was ever... So you think not answering phone calls from coaches and your teammates and the general manager and letting your agent be the go-between there is not forcing your way out? No, sorry, I misspoke. He obviously forced his way out, but I don't think it's as toxic as you're portraying it. And he was quiet and non-existent in the media from a vocal perspective like he was in New York where he was, you know, the Lil Wayne interview, the antics on the sideline. He didn't do that with the Browns. Yeah, because he wasn't putting up big numbers. Like Odell, I feel like his success allows him to be more um, immature. Like, you see the Odell stuff in the uh, Big Apple. You think, okay, you tolerate that because best receiver in football, at least top five. Very good, very young, very productive. You get to Cleveland, the success rate drops off a little bit. And I feel like part of that could be due to maturity. Part of that could be due to the fact that, oh, okay, I'm not putting up these big numbers. My leash is a lot shorter. And then you see in LA that, okay, I have no leash whatsoever because I got brought in as a free agent. I have to be on my best behavior. And I don't know if this is a sign of maturity. I hope it's a sign of maturity for him. I want to be a better person. But if he manages to get a big contract or a larger contract and go be some team's number one wide receiver this offseason, I think those divish tendencies might be rearing their ugly head again. We don't know. The fact that he exited Cleveland in the way he did is a little bit concerning. And you say the Browns had no use to him. Having Odell Beckham Jr. on the field as an offense creates a little bit of gravity, a little bit of intent behind your offense. You have to cover Odell much more than you have to cover whoever the Browns' number two was after he left. He was still a beneficial player to have around. Granted, that season was lost due to many injuries, some of which being to the most important player, Baker Mayfield many of which being to the O-line, the defense, and a little bit to the backfield, but I will agree with you it was not the best situation, but I think Odell certainly made it worse, and forcing his way out, you say quietly, the media is still going to be constantly asking his teammates questions like, oh, did you hear this, that, or whatever from Odell? There is no way to exit a team midseason like that gracefully. You also said, like, the Browns let him go to a contender, like the Browns weren't a contender at the time. They were definitely thought to be a playoff team at the time, so it's not like they're the Lions that were 
were letting Matthew Stafford go to a contender. They didn't. That was something. I think that was weird that was when the injuries had really started piling up, though. That was when Chubb had gone down, and they did not have a backfield whatsoever, and relying entirely on their offensive line to generate their running game. That is when the defense was truly starting to get thin, and that was when stuff was starting to mount up on Baker. I feel like there was some writing on the wall there that their season may have done. I'm sure they would never have released that statement publicly, but I believe they're hanging around what six and five, five and five, six and six around the time you pair all those injuries with that record and the tough back out of the schedule I just don't think they saw themselves a real playoff contender so no they weren't exactly a contender they act like they were a sure thing lock for the playoffs clearly not hey, I feel like we've both made our perspectives pretty clear here I we've talked about it in previous videos I've talked about it on TikTok I think everyone knows where I stand on Odell I think people understand where Isaiah stands on Odell especially since he's a Baker Mayfield you know Not a Baker Mayfield you know, fan person fan boy he's better than uh the people drafted immediately around him at least more impactful but I will say this I don't really dislike Odell I dislike the fact the media has now decided to spin Odell's story as he's some sort of underdog beating the odds in reality he's James Harden except if he actually won a ring which James Harden certainly will not be doing in Philadelphia anyway I have one last thing to say about the game uh, uh, say about the playoffs say about the 2022 Maybe not the last thing about the 2021 NFL season, but the Rams general manager, Les Snead, needs to be in the Hall of Fame just for the Von Miller trade this year. He pushed all of his cards to the middle of the table to trade for Von Miller, who hadn't been as productive as he normally was this year. And he was giving up, I think, a second and was it third round pick or later round pick? He gave up a lot of draft picks for a guy that was on the last year of his contract and it paid off. Von Miller had four sacks in the playoffs, one forced fumble. If he isn't on the Rams, I don't think the Rams even make it to the Super Bowl. They probably don't beat the 49ers and if they did make it to the Super Bowl and the Bengals also still made it to the Super Bowl Joe Burrow would have had a much easier life I would even say the Bengals probably would have won the Super Bowl it would have been easier to block Aaron Donald also take care of Leonard Floyd Vaughn isn't the dominant solo force he was in his prime but he showed he's still an elite edge rusher he played a major role in the Rams Super Bowl and I just wanted to give some credit to him and to acknowledge Les Snead's genius it is very traditional of an LA sports team to buy a championship you can't really do it the same way in um, football as you do in basketball and baseball. Baseball, you literally can just buy a championship by paying all the best players. There is no real salary cap in that. Baseball, or basketball, excuse me. A lot of recruiting elements go into the whole LA thing, which other teams simply do not have. But the Rams have mortgaged their entire future for this Super Bowl. If they can retain the players they traded these picks for, because Stafford costs the first rounder. Obviously, he's going to be around for a little bit longer. Miller costs the second and the third. He might be leaving. I feel like he has played his way into a meaningful contract contract from some team this upcoming offseason and the Rams simply cannot afford to sign him unless he comes back on a discount which why would he unless you're just playing for championships at this point which he very well might be he's a hall of famer regardless but they're going to lose some free agent. They're going to lose Odell unless his injury is terrible and he has to come back and uh, play on a low-level contract. But they've sold their future for the Super Bowl. They have low draft capital in the coming years. And I think it's honestly worth it because winning a Super Bowl is the hardest thing in the big three leagues to do. It's easier to win a World Series. It's easier to win an NBA title. It is very difficult to win a Super Bowl. So much luck and randomness goes into that that accomplishing it feels a little bit sweeter than any of the other rings. And the Rams, a team which just moved to the city, desperately needed this. So they've sold the future and it looks like a good deal at this point. The Von Miller trade, very well done. The Stafford trade, people were saying the Lions won that trade at some points because they thought Stafford was absolutely cooked. Doesn't appear to be cooked to me, but hey, we'll have to wait and see. I'm personally fond of this style of uh, trading. Let's lower level teams or teams with a very real shot winning the Super Bowl go out there and be exciting. Reminds me a little bit of the NBA trade deadline, the star players moving around partway through the year. It is very fascinating to see these things go and come. But anyway, I agree with you. You got anything else before I keep rambling and mumbling? <laughs> well, Odell did say he'd take a Los Angeles discount, which I'm sure is almost certainly going to be offered to him, especially if he has a bad knee injury. Maybe he spends a majority of next year on the IR and then comes back for the Rams' hopeful playoff run. I have no idea. Well, that has been the podcast. Let us know what you thought about the Super Bowl. If you're a salty Bengals fan out there, stop crying. Subscribe to our channel. We're approaching 200 subscribers on YouTube. If you're listening, on audio platforms let us know in the comments of our tiktok or let us know somehow what you thought and we'll see you in the next one